All right. Welcome to the Big Texas Podcast presented by Texas Young Republicans. I am your host, Jordan Overturf, bringing to you another candidate on the trail to get voters to vote for them in 2020. Uh, early voting is continuing this week. Uh, it goes on through Friday, February 28th. So if you have not cast your ballot yet, please get out there and do so. We want as many Republicans to show up to the ballot box during the primary uh, which is on Tuesday, March 3rd, but you still got time to early vote, skip the lines, get out there, do your duty, and uh, just get it out of the way. Uh, again, early voting continues until Friday, February 28th. Super Tuesday election day is on Tuesday, March 3rd. Okay, boy, uh, man, it was a busy weekend. Did you guys catch uh, any of those Bernie rallies? Boy, uh, I am not feeling the burn, uh, and I don't really know that Texans are either as we uh, look at early voting returns. Um, you know, I don't have uh, the latest figures from Monday in front of me, but clearly uh, Republicans statewide are turning out. We got about 100,000 vote lead over Democrats statewide, but we need to keep those numbers going up. Uh, if you live in Harris County, uh, Hayes County, Williamson County, we need Republicans to make sure they turn out. Uh, they're actually within striking distance in all three of these counties. So if you are a Republican or you know a Republican in Harris County, Hayes County, County or Williamson County. Make sure you are getting those folks out to vote. Get them to the ballot box. We need to make sure that we start turning some of these counties uh, back to being represented by Republicans. So get out there, get in force. My guest today is Dr. Trey Penny. Uh, I, I, I will come out and say this right now. Uh, this is probably the best podcast interview that I've ever done. Definitely top five interviews all time. Uh, if you don't know Trey Penny's story, uh, you are going to find this interview very engaging. He is currently running for Congress up in the Dallas area. And uh, I mean, he's a U.S. Army veteran, 20 year uh, Dallas police sergeant and he is he is really advocating for change, not just here in Texas, but at the national level in terms of how uh, we get communities on the same page and working with law enforcement officers. And uh, we go into his history and what personally compelled him uh, to become a peace officer, what compelled him to uh, join the military and all the things that have led him to this point. Uh, I really did have a great time talking to him uh, just because uh, these are the kind of candidates that we hope to see uh, on the on the ballot. These are the folks we want out there fighting for us uh, in Austin and in D.C. So as usual, I'm talking too much. I'm going to get out of the way. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Dr. Trey Penny. who don't know who you are can you give us just a quick uh rundown of your background and kind of your experience yeah i'm uh dr trey penny i'm a doctor of education from texas tech university military veteran uh, army veteran got to make sure you put that out there yeah um and 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 look i'm uh you know i'm a 20 year dallas police sergeant you know i've been police for 20 years in dallas um i think that's what separates me from any other candidate is that look i, I have uh real life experiences that I can rely on that that can uh, that really helped shape my worldview. I mean, I just have so many stories that I can talk to you all day to, about, but uh, I think it's important that that we do we do level um, wh how the the experiences in my life have impacted my my understanding and my worldview as a whole. So, how did you get into the army? What uh, what drew you to? Uh, were you enlisted, commissioned? Yeah, no, I was enlisted. I was enlisted, and and in fact. Um, I'm glad you bring it up because it kind of takes me back to my background. You know, I grew up in the inner city of Houston, Texas, uh, north side, Acres Home. Okay. Uh, predominantly African-American community. Um, like I said, we, you know, this this was more so a, a community that was, you know, uh, principled in their values. I mean, you, you know, you had a, um, the black church was powerful in the community. And, and uh, at the same time, uh, you had a lot of, um, you know, there were a lot of, you know, progressive policies going on in, in this community where, um, you know, as, as uh, young black people, you know, we were just kind of conditioned to, to, you know, be Democrats. We were, we were conditioned to, 
you know, whenever all, you know, we got all this crime and poverty and everything going on around us, you know, we'll just pray about it. You know, it was just, you know, it wasn't really any, any real ideas. Um, so, you know, which, which, uh, which kind of takes me, takes me forward. I, I just kind of remember back when I was, when I was 13, um, one of the most impactful times, I thought it was funny actually, but one of the most impactful times of my life was uh, President George H.W. Bush uh, came to my neighborhood and, and um, at the park, it was Carver Park, it's right across the street from my grandmother's house, he uh, launched his war on drugs from that, from that, uh, from that park. Wow. And uh, I remember, you know, being, you know, sitting with my friends in the ditch, you know, in front of the park. And uh, we just thought it was funny because they, you know, the dope house right across the cor- right across the street, and you know everybody was sitting on buckets in the front yard watching the president. You know, I just thought it was it just just the irony of it because you know that was really what was going on in the community. Man, it was a lot of it was a lot of crime, a lot of murder, a lot of you know drugs. I mean, that's what it was. And you know, I saw it as, as being one of the most impactful times of my life because, man, for the president to have to, the president of the United States to come to my neighborhood. And launch his war on drugs, man. I just thought that that was, man. I just thought, hey, we, look, we got a real problem. So I saw early on that 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 was a problem there, but uh, it still didn't change the way that we lived. It didn't change, it didn't change anything, right? Um, what it did do is probably probably kept us tuned into the uh, into the news a little bit more because we we knew that this problem was there. We knew it was happening. We just kind of ignored it. You know, everybody watched the news to, you know, see who else got killed or whatever. You know, it was just one of those things, but. Um, you know, growing up and, and growing up in this system where all these things are going on around you, it just becomes status quo. You don't, you know, you don't worry about it. You just, you know, you know what's happening, it's there, but you move on. And, um, you know, I, I also remember that during this period, you know, there was a lot of, you know, nowadays I, I see what it is, you know, but these were, these were radical, uh, radical mindsets. You know, these were um, not really gang, uh, gang mentality, but more so, uh, radical, radical individuals in the community that that they were, they were all you know anti-government this, anti-government that, and you know hey I came up in that generation you know I that I saw all this stuff going on around me and I'm like yeah the government you know we don't need the police here the police don't need to be here they're the they're the uh, opposing force that's what's causing all this stuff to happen but it was the exact opposite you know we were we were young young activists or young uh, advocates saying that we don't want the police in our community but we were being victimized at a rate uh higher than they were you know being killed in, in uh, that the murder rate was in in LA. Mm-hmm. LA had criminal gangs uh during this period in the early 90s. So um you know I and I preface that story all the time by just talking about um you know everyone's an advocate until they become a victim. So for me um you know, my, my family, like I said, my, I had a close knit family, but, um, you know, my close knit as in two sides of my family, you know, my mother and father, it was untraditional. My mother and father wasn't together. So, um, my dad had his, you know, my dad's side of the family was really close. My mother fought, my mother's side of the family was, um, somewhat close, you know, but, uh, my grandmother raised me and, um, but for the most part, you know, I, I just remember at, at, uh, at 16, you know, I witnessed my my cousin get killed in front of me days before her wedding day, and and this was at a family family party. You know, it was a family event for her. Um, her fiance was having a bachelor party, and and you know, you know, people get to drinking and acting a fool, and and um, you know, my aunt went down to get my, you know, went to get my uh, get my cousin out the house to come get her fiance from the because they were at my at my uncle's house drinking, and uh, they got into an argument over dice over a domino game and. And uh, she went down to get them, and you know, I just remember, you know, I was I was walking through the trail, and I just remember um, the shooter, you know, the family friend, you know, I, I remember him running past me. I heard the shot, him running past me, and you know, look, my whole family lived on this dirt road, so I'm thinking in my mind, like, you know, hey, what's going on? I'm going, you know, so I just I run through the through the trail, and as soon as you come through the trail, my uncle's house right there, and and um, you know. Um, so anyway, um, you know, 25 years later, you know, those situations still impact people the same way. 
you know. Uh, I've become a lot more, um, a lot more comfortable discussing it. I mean, not not really in detail, but uh, what I've done for the last several years is I've I've, I've ignored it. Like um, I got to a point to where it was there, you know, I knew it, um, but I would I would ignore it because you know I needed to progress. But I know that that was a catalyst for me getting out of my out of out of the situation, leaving the community. And um, you know, I'm growing up in this community with with there's nothing there. You know, there's nobody talking about going to college. Nobody's talking about um, you know being doctors or lawyers, you know, for the most part, you had a lot of athletes. You know, everyone wanted to go off and play college. I mean, play college football or, you know, basketball or whatever. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm not tall enough to be talking about going to play basketball. But um, but at the end of the day, you know, like I said, I didn't have any options. So when you're growing up in this in this, in this this environment where every everything's like, you know, anti-government this and anti-government that, you know, the last thing you're thinking about doing is, is – um, connecting to anything dealing with the government. Um, but just taking taking you back to, to that situation with, with my cousin, you know, and um, you know, we were we were taught to to ostracize the police in my community. But um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, none of those officers that um, none of those officers that showed up looked like me. And now you get to be on the other side of it, you know, serving as a, as a peace officer, going into communities like this where they're experiencing the same tragedy that you yourself have lived through. Um, you know, it's never something that leaves you. Right. You know, tragedy like this sticks with you forever. So uh, for me, I find it interesting that you – were raised under that mentality and yet it seems like everything you have done since leaving that community has built toward you trying to be the example that maybe you wanted to see or you just want to be that example for whoever's coming up next right right you know the um That situation was 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 heavy. I mean, it was, it was a lot going on, but that that was heavy, right? Um, that was something I had to live with. But I will say that had it not been for that, I probably would, I would have never left. Um, I so in my mind, I at at the time, and you look, I'm 17 years, I'm I'm 17, I'm 16 when that happens, and I'm just trying to get out, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm transitioning from from uh, 10th to 11th grade. And, um, you know, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, I'm trying to find a way up out of here. At the same time, you know, during that same period, my 16-year-old girlfriend is pregnant. Um, you know, I got my, my, you know, I got my baby that's, um, you know, she's 16, I'm 17. You know, we're kids. And, you know, her parents are talking about aborting this baby, right? That, that, that You know, they want to they wanna abort the child. And, man, I'm... You know, this is my first child, and I'm like, I'm, I'm begging them, man. I remember how sick I was. I was begging them to keep this baby, right? Because I, I just, I didn't want, you know, I wanted to show this child that I can, that that there is something else, there's something different than this. And uh, so while all this stuff is going on, like I said, I leveraged that, and um, I, I transferred to a to a, um, a a high school where I can and that where I can graduate early. I had enough credits. I was always going to going to uh, summer school with my friends. You know, I was, I was like the smart kid of the bunch. So I would uh, I would go to summer school with my friends just to you know just to be there with them, and um, you know I had enough credits to graduate early. So I I went ahead and graduated. I um, I got out, and, and like I said, that controversial decision that I made uh, turned out to be the most be the best decision I ever made in my life, which was joining the United States Army. Um, and I say controversial because, like I said, you got to remember the environment. You know, this is, <laughs> you know, I had my, my grandfather was in the military. Uh, my uncles were in the military. But during my generation, we had these, like, the, the you know, we got to look at the at these shifts and these changes in society. And 
uh, I was going through this shift of of uh, almost like this 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 rebellious type type ideology where um, you know there's a movie uh, Boys in the Hood out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you seen that? Yeah. There's a there's a part in there where Lawrence Fishburne tells the guy Trey, the mm-hmm. kid Trey, he tells him there's no place for a black man for a white in a white man's army, and that really resonated with my community, man. It was, I mean, that was real. Mm-hmm. So when when I did this. You know, I did this out of, you know, I was, I was bucking the system. You know, I was, I was tired. I was, you know, there was no way out. I was, I was upset. I was resent, resentful, resentful to my family. I was bucking everything that I knew when I joined it. And, and I can't say I didn't have transitional issues, like trying to adjustment issues. Right. But the military have a way to, of, of solving that for you. Yeah. They work the kinks out real quick. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. push ups or potatoes, which yes, was <laughs> yes, sir. But you know what? I, I I'm, I'm very appreciative of it because I knew I knew I couldn't go back home. Right? Mm-hmm. So uh, making that adjustment was I mean it was hard, but I knew I couldn't go home. You know, you had you had people getting you know getting kicked out of the military left and right, but man, that that wasn't an option for me. I couldn't go home. Yeah, I just couldn't. Um, but just to rewind a little bit, so like I said, when those, when those um. Just to just to you know touch back on on that shooting incident, um, when those officers showed up, like I said, we had all we had we had we had almost been believed uh, been been conditioned to believe that that white police officers were an, an oppressive force, and mm-hmm. these white police officers were the ones that were you know holding us down, right? I mean, it's 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 like this government connection when the white people are doing it to you, and when these officers showed up, like I said, these were white officers. And they treated my family with respect, man. They, they, you know, they were very empathetic. And but, you know, but my family was was on the other side. They were still reluctant to cooperate. You know, I, I didn't understand. And I'm watching this, and it, it just didn't make sense to me. And uh, that was kind of like the catalyst that pushed me in the, in the, in the other direction and say, hey, you know what? I want to do what those guys did for me, for somebody else. So, how long were you in uh, the military? Did four years in the army. Yeah, okay. Four years in the army. And- were we stationed? Fort Seal, for the most part, um, Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. Uh, then I got out. They offered me uh, they offered me a ten thousand dollar bonus to, you know, ten more years in in Fort Seal. I mean, uh, in Fort Polk. And I was like, Nah, man. I would go ahead and 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 be, actualize my dream and become a police officer. If I could do it, look, I I didn't even know. It, I I knew that in order to be a police officer, that I had to have, you know, college credit, right? I knew I couldn't go home and be a police officer because you still got look, my family is my family. Now I'm not gonna lie about anybody and say that condition doesn't exist. The condition still exists today. You know, my family is my family. Uh, but I couldn't go there. So, you know, I, at the time Dallas was like the you know, it, and Dallas still is, you know, it's a premier law enforcement agency, one of the top law enforcement agencies in the nation. And uh, you know, I wanted to go to Dallas and you know, I geared up, I um you know, got my associate's degree when I was in the military, and I came out. I applied with Dallas, and you know they 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 signed me up, man. They they brought me in, and I was that was like the the most powerful time of my life, you know. And I, I learned a lot of just learned it. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're fine. You can grab one of those waters right there if you want. Um, I mean. I don't want to say this fascinating, but it is interesting that you, um, you have kind of come 180 from the mentality that you were raised with in that community. Um, how has that changed your approach when you're going into either back to your family or you're going into communities in Dallas where you have seen, uh, how they're raised the conversation, you know, the conversations that are going on inside the home. How did that change your approach, uh, when you were first coming up in a, as a peace officer, uh, into these situations? You know, it was, um, it was easy for me. I mean, the transition is just, is is normal, but you know, we, you got to also remember that, that, that there was some, some, you know, there, there was, there's definitely cultural, uh, understanding that that you have to have when engaged in certain communities, right? And when when I came through in the early nineties, there was this this um, uh, I'm sorry, in the latter part, in the latter nineties, I came on in nineteen ninety nine, but 
we were we were almost conditioning officers to to be afraid, like to you know be ready for what's going to happen in the community, right? Be ready. And what what would what would make an officer coming from rural Ohio coming here? Um, you know, those things will put that officer on the edge. But but me, I mean, like like okay, that's <laughs> that's normal. So when I go in, I I I can go in and talk to somebody, and we can. You know, I can say what I need to say. They can say what they need to say and say, all right, now let's go. You know, let's, let's go. It's time to go now. Mm-hmm. All right, they're going to put their hand behind their back, and <laughs> it's, it's different. But you can come in there and you can make that situation a, a, a whole lot worse by coming in and, and disrespecting that family or whatever because, you know, and and, it, and that goes with every culture. You know, every, every um, you know, every every demographic in, that com- in, in, the, in the minority community, uh, officers have to they have to have cultural understanding because uh you know in certain communities especially you know the the uh hispanic community you know you you're not going to go into this man's house and belittle him and from his family those things not going to happen but it wasn't until later on until until our agency started implementing those those type of trainings but we knew that because it was you know this is where you know we grew up like this so it, you know the cultural adjustment with 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 officers i i think it took time for that to evolve, right? Um, but my understanding was was completely different. Um, like I said, I enjoyed those experiences because I touched a whole lot of people. Um, even still, you know, that was like the. Um, so I, 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 I say everything in my life. I, I almost look at it like um, everything is connected to something else. And while being a police officer, you know, it, it was there was a lot of high times, a lot of low times. A lot of the low times were, were you know, with, with my friends, you know, friends I came up with that were being, you know, that were dying in the line of duty, you know. And, and man, I was being, it, it was like, you know, I was, I was, I was, those transitions were really difficult, you know. Um, but what I found in that was that I was, I was creating these bonds with the, with the widows, you know what I'm saying? Like I would go and support them, you know, whatever they need. And that kind of, um that kind of, you know, kind of fulfilled an attachment that I had to my, to my brothers, you know, and, um, that kind of, kind of morphed me into creating the, you know, my fallen officer foundation, right? So, um, that was the goal was to support these officers that die in line of duty and, um, and, and then do events for the widows, right? And now, you know, we, we're talking, well, five years later, you know, that organizations are strong. They do they do what they have to do. And on top of that, um, you know, I'm, I'm nationally recognized as a law enforcement advocate, you know, because I was able to go out and fight issues that um, actual either either the police unions won't fight uh, or the, the agencies can't fight and, and the officers don't fight. So so give me one of those issues that you uh, you went out and advocated for. Um well, one of the biggest, I think what really put me in the, um, what really springboarded um, who, who I was nationally was was my stance on the Black Lives Matter movement, right? So, you know, I knew immediately. And, and during this during the same period, I mean, it's, like I said, everything is connected. Man. It's almost like like, <laughs> like a puzzle, you know, you piece these puzzles together. But um, so during this time, I'm working on my PhD, uh, my doctorate from uh, Texas Tech, right? I'm working on my on my dissertation. I'm in my chapter five, and we're talking about, um, you know, I'm looking at mitigating the outcomes of these shooting attacks on college campuses. So that was like a big thing. You know, this is during, you know, 2015, 17, you know, you got all these shooting attacks that's popping up everywhere. Yeah. And um, so one of the, the pieces of my research was looking at, um, you know, how were these individuals being inspired, uh, being radicalized? You know, what was you know, what was connecting the dots for these, these radicalized groups. So anyway, um, one of the radicalized groups that came under my radar was uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, they had initially emerged back in, uh, I think it's 20, 20, 2014, like right after uh, Trayvon Martin, and, and they kind of had this LBGT agenda, and they were trying to morph in with the new Black Panther Party, and it, and it didn't work. You know, that was like, <laughs> you know, I mean, if you know the, you know anything about the two the two ideologies, you know that, that there's no way that that would connect. Yeah. So after um, after the Michael Brown deal in Ferguson, uh, man, it, it took off like wildfire because they removed that part of the agenda. They removed the LGBT part of the agenda 
And then it just became about police brutality. Mm-hmm. And and they wrote that. I mean, they they really they pressed that issue into the community. And um, man, I mean, look, they 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 generated a following uh, because so much money was being so much dark money was being poured into these into this movement, right? Um, they were organizing these these um, radicalized protests across the country, and they were and they were using um, social media to do it. So, make a long story short, um, I understood what was happening because so, through my research. So, um, the um, you had Ferguson happen twice. Then, it, then you know, you had a, the Baltimore situation occur. And then I got noticed that they were coming here. They were going to do their protests here. So um, I already knew what it was. And, and we Dallas simply didn't have that type of relationship with the community. It was it was different. This this wasn't a Baltimore. This wasn't a, you know, wasn't a, a Chicago or whatever. It wasn't that. You know, this was, we were already doing community engagement stuff. And the race, relationship just wasn't. It, that wouldn't have worked here. It just, we didn't have that type of relationship. Mm-hmm. So when it was coming, um, and I, I knew that the that the, the black church was helping them organize, so look, I called them up, like, hey, look, we don't have to do this. You don't have to do that type of protest. Um, you know, if, you, if, if people want to come out and talk, if they want to, uh, you want to have a town hall meeting, symposiums, whatever you want to do, let's get people together and let's talk about real issues and let's talk about how we can improve their their condition, right? And, uh, you know, I got now, Sarge, they don't want to do that. They want to march. They want to march. So, um, look, I mean, fast forward, they want to march, and, and five police officers dead. You know, then you got a whole lot of people that step back. Oh, no, I ain't had nothing to do with that. Well, you know, it's almost like you have a you have a house party. It's your house party. You call it. People come there, and they get hurt at your house party. Who's liable for it? Well, you know, I knew what the issue was. I I knew, um, like I said, it, it it was a it was a during this during the same time you had um, you know the president of the United States you had Barack Obama um, coming out and he you know he's telling people um, you know he brought Black Lives Matter to the White House and and um, you know he told them to you know keep keep doing what they're doing to to bring about this change and uh, you know he, you know it just it was irresponsible you know what I'm saying because it didn't. It didn't acknowledge uh, the fact that that you know these black people, yeah, they were organizing, but they they were destroying their own communities. They were destroying what they had. Just go back and look at Baltimore, right? After they tore up Baltimore, then they had to they had to go to the federal government and ask for you know thirty what was it thirty twenty whatever you know two billion dollars to to come in and re- refix it, right? I mean, it was like um, it, it didn't make sense, mm-hmm. it, you know. Anyway. Anyway, um, I was thrown in the middle of my own research um, when the shooting attack happened in Dallas. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, two of my friends were, were really good friends in, in that deal um, that I lost in that that tragedy. And um, um, like I said, that threw me right in the middle of my research. And um, I wanted to do something about it. So what I did was you know, I started reaching out to the local leaders, right, the local leaders that I thought had an interest in the black community, and I tried to see if they wanted to, you know, let's, you know, let's let's fix this issue, you know, let's, let's do something to address this radicalized movement, you mm-hmm. know, before other officers get killed across this country. And um, they didn't want to do it. They didn't want to step up. So I started reaching out, man. I started calling, um, you know, I reached out to Freedom Watch. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with Larry Clayman, but... I reached out to Freedom Watch and and uh, just hope that they would uh, that they would listen to me. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, they called me back at first. You know, when he, when he talked to me about it, you know, I talked. And actually, Larry called me himself. Larry Clayman called me himself, and and uh, you know, he told me about it. And he he said, "Do you realize what what this is going to do? You know, you realize that you're going to get death threats. You realize, you know, what all this is." And I was like, "Man." Man, let me think about it. You know, let me think about it. You know, I I really have to. This needs to be done, but I need to I need to you know I need to figure out how to how to do it right. And um, you know, about about the next day, man. I you know, like I said, I saw the news. The news were were, comp- were constantly, um, you know, just 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 pumping it up. You know, it was like setting the stage for another shooting to happen. You know, yeah. it's like look, this was this was a bad situation in Dallas. But if it wasn't for the police, then they wouldn't have that. And, and the, the media just kept pushing it. 
and I, I call him up. I call him up and I say, um, um, you know, go file it. You know, file it. Do it. So I filed the lawsuit against Black Lives Matter and and you know all the radicals that were involved in that. You had um, Louis Farrakhan, Al Sharpton, uh, Eric Holder. You know, all of them. I, you know, put them in there. And then shortly after that, um, Hillary Clinton. She held a uh, Hillary Clinton at, at one of her one of her, her speech platforms. She did. Uh, she said, "I one of her, one of her statements was, we got to teach." We got to teach our black people, uh, teach our black ho- officers how to deal with black people. Now, you know, and I and and, and I heard the, the the deal, and I'm like, man, so you guys, you saying one or two things? Either you saying that that the yeah that the white police officers, I teach white police officers how to deal with black people. Either you saying that all white police officers are racist, or you saying that black people are animals, and we got to teach officers specifically how to deal with these animals, and. Anyway, make a long story short, I called Larry up and said, man, throw her in there, too. <laughs> well, and I, that shooting happened, uh, what, a week or two, maybe a month before the Republican National Convention in Cleveland. And I remember that, you know, people around me at the right. time were real worried about me going up there to be a convention, uh, you know, because of all the protests, all the security. You went down to downtown Cleveland. Right. and right. I, I know. You know, it it was a bit alarming. You know, we talk about American as the America as the speaking of freedom, right? right? And when our downtown cities start to look like war zones on the news, and right. we're barricading them as if they're war zones to prepare for any unknown onslaught, like we've kind of lost our way, right? You know, right. so. You're out there. You're pushing against you know this narrative. You're oh. yourself being a beacon, uh, not only for police officers but also in these communities where they right. feel disenfranchised by the relationships between cops. Um, of course, of course. How how does all of this culminate into you choosing to run for Congress? Well, I have to take you back a little bit. Okay, J- just to get me just to get you there. So while this whole radicalized agenda is going on, it's, it's happening on social media. So I'm already an advocate. I'm an advocate for law enforcement. And I'm also pushing for uh, legislative reform for uh, uh, for social media, right? Mm-hmm. So basically, it's an outdated piece of legislation, the 1996 Communication DC Act, Section 230, which basically provides for broad immunity for these third-party platforms to uh, basically have immunity for what, individuals post on their platforms, yeah. right? So Black Lives Matter would not have been Black Lives Matter had it not been for Facebook, right? Had it not been for Twitter, had it not been for Google, uh, because they 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 proliferated the message. They, they made it wi- wider than it needed to be, and it drew people in. Even though they knew that the message was radicalized, it drew people in. And you had some people on, on one side, and these are, this is me talking to legislators. I'm not going to say no names, but me talking to legislators, and they telling me, well, now you're getting into free speech. You're getting into free speech. I said, no, we're not dealing with free speech. What you're dealing with is, is you have, it, if you really think about this. Now, Chablansky versus New Hampshire basically said that, that uh, hate speech is the only speech that's not protected, mm-hmm. right? So anything that will incite an individual to violence. Now, you, I'm expecting these legislators to know this. Yeah. This, is not, this is not just free speech. You're going out here calling somebody a name. That's not that. These are actual uh, uh, situations that are that are rhetoric that's causing individuals to attack. Yeah. Right. Fighting words. Fighting words. Things that are citing individual violence. So anyway, but anyway, make, make a long story short. Um, I couldn't get any traction on that, and I was getting all this material from this cyber intelligence company that I was working with out of out of New York, uh, Gapek, and uh, Eric Feinberg. Man, he you got to look at some of his research. Um, but but he was he was giving me all this material and he was showing me how these groups were I mean it was these platforms were completely just just um, just negligent in their responsibilities mm-hmm. and, and they were giving us this this radicalized message for us to attack each other and um, so I couldn't get I I, I um, so while this is going on I remember that a day before the actual attack happened, well, I learned about it afterward, but a day before the, uh, the attack happened, an image showed up on social media that uh, showed an officer with his throat slit. 
basically what it was with the, was a Jane Foley image where they put they made it into like a cartoon and they put the officer in a uh, they made it into a police officer and they had an ISIS fighter, a revolutionary fighter behind him slitting his throat. And the Cleveland Browns running back Isaiah Crowell tweeted that image, right? Um, and and it, and it and it it took off, right? Mm-hmm. So Cleveland. Um, now I'll tell you every these all these puzzles do not stick together. Follow me here. Follow me. So um, Isaiah Crowell, he tweets the image, and I mean there's backlash against the Cleveland Browns and Cleveland Browns. I mean you got the Cleveland Police Association. They're saying that they, uh, the you know they don't they going they don't want anything to do with them. You mm-hmm. know you got the, the community out in Cleveland. They're riled up. Yep. Uh, man, it was it was crazy. So he tells ESPN that he's going to donate his first check to my organization, uh, Dallas Fallen Officer Foundation. So uh, anyway, when ESPN called me up, uh, no, it, it was it was uh, the Browns. They called me up and they said, look, he, we want to get this check to you. You know, how do you get it? I mean, how do we get it to you or whatever? I said, I don't want this kid money. I want to talk to him. You know, send him down here. You know, I was actually getting ready to go to um, to uh, Patrick and John Reaper's funeral, Right. And I said, I don't, I don't want, I don't want the uh, the money. I want to talk to the kid. I want to, I mean, to the to the office. I mean, to the running back. You know, uh, Isaiah, mm-hmm. um, because I wanted him to understand what service and sacrifice was about. And he was like, Well, well, Sarge, we don't want this to be a, um, we don't want this to be a, a story. You know, we just want this to go away. And I said, Okay, well, look, if he's serious about about understanding what what happened here, I want him to come down, right? And because uh, I understood that that image that he shared was was think about this, the media, the president, and everyone had already approved Black Lives Matter. They had already said this was this was the movement. This was the movement that was that everyone should be following, yeah. right? And he saw hashtag Black Lives Matter, and he tweeted, right? That's what he saw, and. Hashtag Black Lives Matter was connected to all this nefarious stuff that a lot of people just, whatever, make a long story short. Uh, I didn't think he was going to come in. He flew in. I met him in Fort Worth. And uh, we talked that night for a couple of hours, man. I mean, you know, look, he, young man, you know, young man, just same age as my son. And, um, you know, I, I'm talking to him about, you know, this, I, I get it. You know, I understand what, what you're going through, but there is a whole nother world out here. Because when he saw me, he was like, you know, you, you're a police officer? You know, you're a black police officer? Like, yeah, I'm a black police officer. I'm, <laughs> I'm here talking to you about this. And uh, so anyway, we end up going to the funeral. And, and um, like I said, they said absolutely no publicity on this. So I just wrote a post about my interaction. And uh, I don't know who fought, who got the post, but the post ended up going viral. And and after that, I ended up, um, um, ended up talking to the Cleveland, the uh, Cleveland Police Association, uh, Steve Loomis, mm-hmm. end up talking to him about it, and um, you know, he's a really, really good friend of mine. And um, you know, I just told him, I said, "Look, you know, the, the, the kid made a mistake. You know, I like to get you with the Browns together and let y'all fix that situation." And uh, and it worked out. You know, they looked, they they got together, and and you know, that's kind of what I do. You know, I, I kind of I pull pieces together, and and um, you know, we worked it out. You know, so Cleveland was able to move forward. That was prior to the convention. Mm-hmm. Um, they were able to move forward with that. And then um, I ended up flying into into Cleveland a short time later, and um, Rudy Giuliani wanted to meet with me, mm-hmm. right? So he was going in to talk to the union or whatever. And um, I sat down and I talked to him about my position. I said, look, you know, this is this is what's going on. This is, you know, this is how this happened. And, and you know, I just want the, want the public to know that, you know, Black people don't feel like they're under attack by the police. You know, we need our police in our communities. We don't want, you know, look, you can ostracize your police. You can you can take one situation, you can blow that into, um, you know, in, into a, a phenomena, right? And 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 you can have police lay down, right? You police lay down. They're not going to, they're not coming, right? Uh, they'll come, but every, everybody be dead by the time they get there. Mm-hmm. And that's the other side of it. I mean, look, we could, we could, Talk about how illegal it is or whatever, but the fact of the matter is, as long as the officer driving the speed limit to get to the call, you see what I'm saying? That, yeah. that that's what it is. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to push back against, you know, I, I didn't want the community to have that type of relationship with the law enforcement officer. And I uh, flew into Cleveland. Make a long story short, um, Rudy Giuliani endorsed me, endorsed my position. Um, you know, I endorsed Trump. 
you know, we, we moved on, you know, we did, what we had to do, uh, you know, but since then, you know, I started doing a whole lot of stuff politically, you know, I was like, you know, like I said, I was an advocate doing, you know, talking to law enforcement agencies across the country about, you know, protecting our police. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, back in 2018, I ended up, uh, I, I got offered a presidential appointment to the white house and, you know, I thought, you know, I, I'm thinking that, that carrying a, uh, having a title is, is what I needed, you know. I mean, it w- it's good to have a title, but having a title doesn't really help me fix the problems that I want to fix. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I said I wanted to run for Congress. You know, I told the guys, I said, look, you know, this is, this is, this community is failing. You know, we get, this lady's been in office 26 years, 84 years old. You know, the community is failing. You got the highest crime rate in the state of Texas, you know, failing infrastructure. You got schools failing. You got the lowest academic outcomes of any school in this in the North Texas region. I mean, in the district of the North Texas region, you know, we got to do more. And, you know, I, I just, uh, after praying about it and, and you know, put that on my back, I said, I'm running. I'm running for Congress. Put my name in. And, uh, you know, hey, I'm, I'm in. I'm running. <laughs> so do you buy into this larger, you know, discussion that's out there about more and more African Americans leaving the Democratic Party and going to the Republican Party. All right. All right, man. Look, I got it. Okay. I'm glad you bring it up because I got to talk to you about this. Okay. That may be happening, happening superficially, right? But the Republican Party, the Republican Party doesn't have a messaging problem. Right. And I, and I, I tell you, you don't have, they don't have a messaging problem. Messaging is great. You know, blacks coming over to, it's great. But we have an image problem. Mm-hmm. Right. You, you, the, the people, and this, this is me talking to the people in, in, in the inner city. So you got to listen to me. You got to catch me on this. The minorities that are hearing that rhetoric, right, and they see the people that we're putting in front of them. They see us, uh, they see the Republican Party as giving, giving them gimmicks. They see these individuals that are, yeah, they, their skin color may look the same, but they're not, they're not of, of what's happening in the community. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we got to step back, right? So as a, as a, as a conservative, right, and, and I, I, like to, I like to refer to myself as a, as a, um, as a compassionate conservative, right, because I believe in, in, in free market capitalism and, and merging it with public-private partnerships to, to raise people out, out of poverty, out yep. of their despair, and giving opportunities for people to grow. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think we have, to, we have to leverage that, right, with, with, okay, who are you giving the message to? If I got somebody, I'm not saying you got you to gotta live, live there. What I'm saying is you have to understand the culture because you can't go in talking about um, – educating people about something that 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 they you know that they know hap- is happening completely different on the ground right um just historical context i don't know if you you may already know this um 1964 election you know bear gold water you you know that whole you follow that whole deal right mm-hmm. and and the republican party not lost 86 percent of the african-american vote after that mm-hmm. okay the republican party Real, they didn't need the votes to continue to remain the minor, the majority, so they they moved on, right? So now we see this cultural change. We see that that you know now we have uh, uh, Hispanics being the largest growing uh, minority population in this country. Uh, you see African Americans, you know that the 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 uh, ratio starting to balance out now, and now they're realizing that now it's time to go after the minority vote. Mm-hmm. Well, I always say. I can't reach you if I'm not there. And I want people, I, I want the Republican Party to know that you have to be there, right? You have to be there. You, you have to be able to resonate. Your message has to be able to resonate in these communities. And it's not going to be able to resonate when you're saying, okay, I know you're over there, but come over here. And, and, and we can fix the problem over here. The problem is there. That, that's every, every, Republican Party across this country should be setting up offices in the inner city. Mm-hmm. Their offices shouldn't be on the outskirts. Put it in the inner city. You want people to come out and see you and talk to you? Put your office right there. Let them come in and come talk to you. That's why I think that the problem exists. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I say when I build, after I finish this election, when I build this, 
this infrastructure in place, I would hope that the Republican Party doesn't lose it. I would hope that our local Republican Party doesn't lose it because we're building an infrastructure. The people, look, I got people that are Democrats that are helping me. Why? Because they believe in me. They know that I, they know I know what I'm talking about. I'm not playing no games. I come from it. I <laughs> get it. I'm not saying that, that, that I am, um, um, I, I, I like to believe that I understand people. And not just as a college professor. I mean, I could talk all day long about theoretical perspectives. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, I'm talking about how things practically happen in people's real life. Mm -hmm. Right, how these, how your policies impact the way that people live, and make no mistake, people are looking at that too. The people in this district, in District Thirty, people are tired. They are tired, man. They're, they're, look, they got they they got kids getting killed every other week, right? The highest murder rate in the state. They are tired of people coming to them with the same old solutions mm -hmm. over and over, uh, uh, same old talking points over and over again. Well, and this is a community where you can't bring the Republican Party platform and say, look at this, you know, they're probably not even looking at the 300 plus planks that are on there. You know, they're concerned about, uh, actually, that's a great question. What is this community concerned about? You know, what are the issues that they want to see addressed as opposed to, you know, the messaging that pundits think they want to hear it's it's the the three part the three pillars of my platform crime education and economic development you, these three things are impacting these these communities like never before um when like i said we we have one in 17 people and they, these these numbers were were last year one in 17 people are victims of crime in this district mm -hmm. right that's that's forty two thousand people. That's seven hundred thousand people. And there's forty two thousand people that are victimized by crime in this district. Okay, that's that's one in seventeen, right? So you have a chance just by you know just being there that you're gonna be victimized. Mm -hmm. You have infrastructure, right? And one one of the biggest issues that I have to I have to address is that leadership leadership making bad decisions. Yeah. Okay. There was a call wise. There was a, there's a car wash on MLK Boulevard. Okay, now I'm very familiar with the car wash. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I know the know the owner. You know, uh, Dale's a great guy. Um, but what but what was happening with this car wash was this was like the hangout. This is where on the weekends where, you know, you got groups come out there to hang out. Look, you, you got to have some cultural understanding. You got to understand that they, yeah, after the club they're gonna hang out somewhere, mm -hmm. right? This was the hangout spot. You know what I'm saying? Some washing their cars, others just got the music up, everybody partying, whatever. That's that's culture. That's there, right? So Dale would understand, you know, that these these, you know, these parties, you know, are organically happening every weekend, and he's calling, he's reporting for the police to come out there. Mm -hmm. Come out here, come out here, right? Keep in mind, this is the district with the highest crime rate. So officers can't they going from call to call. They ain't got time to be going to to go over there, right? To 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 deal with someone else's property. So what ended up happening was there, there ended up being a, a you know a shooting that happened there. And actually, maybe a couple of shootings that happened there. Let me rewind that. But shooting happened there, okay? And rather than the 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 leaders that be uh, deciding that they're going to uh, work with this business owner to help the business owner keep their property while at the same time providing resources to help balance that, balance that out, they decide to go ahead and shut it down. Mm -hmm. Right? So what you end up doing was they, they shut it down and then the crime, the shootings start happening around the same thing. Right? So I, 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 I leverage all this and say that you can't effectively address crime without addressing the conditions that create crime. Okay, classic broken windows theory. We heard about this in early 90s, right? Classic broken windows theory. You leave items in your community broken, eroded. You give the impression no one cares, and that facilitates the crime. Mm -hmm. Okay, they put a fence up around this. In a, in a, in a, a city, in a community that's already in, in, in dire needs, and what you do is you go put a sore black eye right in the middle of it. Yep. Right? That, that, that proliferated that problem. It made it worse, right? It exacerbated a problem that didn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. So 
that that's just one that's just one example. But I say that to say that we gotta have we gotta have real leadership that understands how to deal with this. I'm I'm here for the business. I'm gonna make sure that we're fighting for the businesses, right? Because once these businesses leave, once they decide to go elsewhere, and we, and we can't we can't even I, look. I always talk about marginalizing districts, right? Mm-hmm. When they shut that that car wash down, you force people who only had access to that car wash to now drive across town to go get their car wash, right? If that's not a discriminatory practice, I don't know what is. Like, am I right or am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, that's putting I, a burden on the community. Yeah. <laughs> it put a burden on the community. So anyway, I, I'll say that to say that, you know, we have to have, we have to have common sense, you know, approaches, right? We, we got decisions. We got, we got leaders in, in uh, the, the district attorney that says that they won't prosecute theft over $750, Right. Yeah. You can arrest them, but we're not going to prosecute it. So what do the businesses do? Pick up, leave. Yeah. Right. They can't afford to take those kind of losses. Mm-hmm. Those are irresponsible decisions that are being made. So what I would do from a congressional perspective, since I'm, I would be way up here, is to say, hey, city leaders, you make that kind of decision, you're going to forfeit some money. Yeah. Right. You make those kind of decisions that marginalize those people and subject them to further victimization. You're gonna forfeit your money. Well, that, it looks that, it, it sounds like you've got a real common sense approach to uh, to these problems in the communities that you want to actually go in and help. Uh, I'm sorry, we got to wrap up now, uh, but I would love to bring you in. I I, God, man, for <laughs> almost an hour now. That's right. I'm sorry, man. No, I'm you're sorry. good, man. I had a great time doing this. Uh, so let's go ahead. We're going to definitely bring you back. But uh, for now, for people who want to learn more about Dr. Trey Penny, you, your story, your campaign, what's the best way for them to do that? Learn more about me at uh, pennyforcongress.com. That's P-E-N-N-I-E for congress.com. And uh, go to the website. Look, I need your support. I understand that this is not one of the, the pretty districts that everyone, all the Republicans want to focus on. Uh, but what I will say is that that after this election, the uh, we're, we're going to change this D29. We're going to impact that Cook PVI. We're going we're gonna to re- change that D29 to an R3. Y'all like that? Yeah, I like it. <laughs> You're going to get it done, Trey. Thank you so much for coming in today. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you again to Dr. Trey Penny for joining us. Again, he is uncontested in the CD30 Republican primary, so he is on his way to November. Uh, If you live in the Dallas area, make sure you reach out to him and get active. Uh, Republicans across the state need to make sure they are getting engaged and getting active. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but outside groups are ready to pour millions, if not billions of dollars into Texas in an effort to flip Texas blue. Uh, And this isn't just happening at the federal level, not just at the presidential level. They want to flip the legislature. So we need to make sure that you are getting out there and voting. Again, early voting ends Friday, February 28th. The primary election is on Tuesday, March 3rd. We need to make sure that we are out there in force and we are making sure that we are controlling the Texas legislature, that we are controlling our county commissioner's courts. Uh, Clearly, from the things that are happening in some of these cities, uh, liberal policies are not living up to the Texas miracle, the Texas dream. They're not becoming of the 10th largest economy in the world. And so we need to be active at every single level. Uh, Thank you again for listening. If you are listening on iTunes or Spotify, make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button. Uh, If you are on Google Podcasts, Podcast Addict, this podcast is everywhere. YouTube, you can subscribe there. Uh, Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Big Texas Podcast. Make sure you are following the Texas Young Republicans on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Texas YRs. And early vote again. Thank you all again for listening. I appreciate it. We're going to do this together. Uh, I am looking forward to talking to more candidates. Uh, They'll all be candidates on the road to November at this point. So, uh, and we've got some policy experts that'll be coming on down the road too. So until then, friends, we'll see you down the road.